Coming live from Berkeley, California, USA is our guest this morning. Welcome to this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts, either through their insights, information, or simply learning from them. And today we have Jeremy Sherman, a PhD science researcher and writer on the origins of life, human nature, and also has a great understanding about total jerks. So welcome to the show, Jeremy. What a pleasure to be with you, AJ. Great, and it's a great morning down here in New Delhi, and it's, it becomes better by having you on the show, such a respected person, such a learned person, who <laughs> knows about, you know, science researcher and writer, who knows not only about, you know, uh, the origins of life, but also about the origin of jerks. And that becomes much more important and relevant because we meet a lot of jerks in our everyday life. So, Jeremy, my first question itself is, you know, that a lot of discussion has already happened about the origins of life and everybody has their own explanation from science to people to general people. Yes. What about the origin of jerks. Is there a confusion about it? Or you can actually pinpoint this is where jerks come from. Where do jerks come from? Where do they, where come do they from? suddenly land up in front of us? <laughs> I'm asking several questions so that you can respond to them at leisure. Um, there is a, there's a, a, a great treasure of jerks um, somewhere in the United States, and that's where they came from. I'm just kidding. No, uh, jerks show up everywhere, um, and it does relate to the origins of life because the kind of origins of life work that I do is about trying. That is, if you think about it, chemical things, tables, uh, computers, they're not trying to do anything. They're not trying to keep themselves going, but living beings do try to keep themselves going. And so that's what we call the struggle for existence. So I'm not just trying to explain how chemistry copies itself because chemicals copying themselves is not just trying they're not trying but we are we living beings are trying all organisms are trying trees are trying so what's different about us and believe it or not i'm still talking about jerks um when a tree tries it doesn't think or feel when an animal tries it feels but with humans we get thinking and feeling and feelings are very strong and one of the effects of being able to think which is a power we ha have gained from language, from having language, is that we can imagine idealizations. We can picture gods who don't have to try anymore because they have achieved everything. They are all-knowing, they are all-powerful, they are all-good. This is not necessarily true in the, um, in the polytheistic religions like Hinduism, but in the monotheistic religions, we imagine God as having succeeded at everything, and we aspire to be like him in a way. So we play God. This is a temptation that is available to human beings that is not available to a dog or a cat or a cow. They cannot use words to imagine themselves in an ideal state. Uh, they cannot become devoted to um, a fake guru who pretends that he knows everything and, and is right about everything and is righteous and all of that. So being a jerk is a human thing. There are many animals that uh, exploit other animals. There are parasites um, uh, and, uh, and predators and all of that. But being a total jerk, and total is an important word there, is a human thing. It is a consequence of us trying, but also of us imagining being able to achieve everything and play God. Right, right. So you mean if jerks are good at manipulating then they should be smart people. But why do we call stupid, uh, it's almost another word for stupidity. Or yes. can say, so we say, if he's a total jerk, or don't be a, don't be a jerk, how, is, how do you see these two this things? Is a, this is a great together? question. This is a very important question. Um, uh, yes, we wonder with a total jerk about whether they are stupid or stupid like a fox. That is whether they're right. clever. And what I would argue is often overlooked is how easy it is to play God. 
Um, and how when you're playing God successfully, when people are letting you get away with it, you no longer have to think. That is, the, you get freedom from thinking, freedom from doubt, freedom from uncertainty, freedom from curiosity. And so this is why they are very interesting because they, um, I think that they use words um, the way animals use animal sounds. That is, they're not really saying things, and we are in trouble if we pretend, if we assume that they are. They're just braying like a donkey. They just happen to bray in the way that sounds like words to us and confuse us. So it's very important to recognize how simple it is to become someone who plays God simply by making sounds that make it so that no matter what you do, it's always the best. So I call it the wild card, trump card formula. Wild card means you can do anything you want, and the trump card means whatever you do is always the best thing that could be done. So it's total freedom and total safety. Total freedom and total freedom from doubt. And it's very tempting. And we, you end up with large populations who all decide to brand themselves to the same stupidity, the same jerkiness. We call these cults. So a cult would be a, a, is plural of jerk, from my perspective. It's a bunch of people who are all acting like they have the absolute truth, they know the one true way, and anybody who disagrees with them is stupid and evil and deserves to be killed. So that's, that's the extreme. And my feeling is that if we do not figure out how to disappoint these people, how to humbly humble them, we will not survive as a species. There's a big question is how do you humbly humble someone who will say or do anything to avoid humility? Big question. Right. Right, right Jeremy. But you see, when we say that a lot, you are a science researcher. Yes. And whenever there is a new thing that happens, even in science, or new sort of a trend that, or innovation or invention, whatever you say, or, or, or understanding of human mind, and they do something, even in the field of medicine, then they say, do not try to act God. What does that oh, mean? Ah, right. Yes. And, and, and there, because you say that a lot of people, jerks, some of them, they try to act gods. Now, how does it happen whenever you want to do something new or something innovative? But from that point of view, the person is very smart. You may not, some laws may not allow you to do your experiments perhaps on land. So they go down to seas and do their experiments there uh, from, from a ship. Many stories come in. So yes. would you call them new age thinkers, new scientific experiments which will take humanity forward? Or will it be about in the same bracket as cults who, 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 who are know-alls? How do you differentiate ah, between very good a good question. jerk yes. and a bad jerk? Yes. Um, in... In when one, one is playing God, one believes that one has the final answer, the ultimate answer, and that um, there is no need for further evidence, no need for further research, because you already know the answer. So, for example, in the United States, there are what we call fundamentalist Christians who believe that everything you need to know is already in the Bible. There's no need to learn anything else. You just have to be born again, and then you will be aligned with God, you will humble, your, humble yourself before God, and then you can lord it over everybody else. Now, I do a lot of research in what's called philosophy of science, which is trying to figure out, is science different? Is it just the same as what people have always done? How is it different? That kind of thing. So I do a lot of research there. Science is different. When we come up with an answer in science, it is the best answer so far. And it is always to be beaten by a better answer if a better answer comes along. Now, to someone who is playing God, they will often say, uh, you should not play God. You should not pretend you are God and do these things because they have a very strict idea about what is okay and what's not. Remember that they're acting as the servants of God. And by the way, you could be a jerk. Uh, I know plenty of jerk scientists. 
I know plenty of jerk religious people. I know plenty of jerks who are atheists. That is, it's not about what you pretend to believe or what you claim to believe. It's about how you strut it as though you know the, you have the last word. That's what it's about. Science never gets the last word. That is, the pursuit of science is the pursuit of better words, better ideas, better concepts, better ways to do things. And so I, not everybody would agree with me about this, and that's fine. But I am very committed to a belief that's called fallibilism in philosophy. Fallibilism, I think, of the mantra of a fallibilist is, no matter how confident I am in a bet, I remain still more confident that it is a bet. All I get to do is try. I make guesses. My guesses could turn out wrong. But that's how it works in science. So, for example, working as a scientist, I've now been working in this field for 25 years, I have to live with the, the possibility that I will have wasted my whole life pursuing the wrong answers. That is, it's possible. There are many scientists who spend their whole lives what we call barking up the wrong tree. That is, looking for an answer where the answer isn't. Because science is a search party. And we consider it heroic to participate in the search party, even if you're not the one who discovers the answer. So even though you didn't find the answer, that you were one of the people searching counts with us. That's not how it works when you become a total jerk. When you become a total jerk, playing God, whether you're religious or not, because like I said, you could be a scientist who's a jerk, but when you play God, you don't act like you're the search party. You act like you're the hero who always knows the answer and always wins and is always right and is always righteous and is always powerful. That's the problem. And that's the difference, too. OK. OK. And now coming to our day to day life. Yes. Uh, Jeremy. And that is where this actually, you know, uh, concerns us a lot. Yes. Uh, because you meet a lot of people. And then you find that you'd better not have met them. So, <laughs> yeah. But you come to know only later. Yes. As you said. And you're you stuck with them. You married yes. them. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to know, but only when you have manipulated you. Then you come to know, okay, I, I thought the person was stupid, but it, it's not like that. And sometimes, or many a times, uh, you cannot, when you see a donkey, you actually know it's a donkey. You go and, don't go and do research on a donkey's mind. You just know it's a That's donkey. That's right. That's right. Sometimes <laughs> you just think of jerks like that. Right. But some jerks are beyond that. They manipulate you. So how does a common person in, in, a, uh, in a home atmosphere, in personal yes. relationships, in workplaces, yes. or even in clients, yes. Do you recognize who a jerk is, who is a manipulative so, jerk? So how can you tell whether you're dealing with a jerk? Is Yes. Yes, yes that's the question. Because that's going to drain, drain you. If it's a personal relationship, it can that's drain right. you. Yes. It can, if it's a work relationship, it can ruin you because you'll be dealing with something wrong. And yes. if it is some manipulative jerk, yes, then you'll be left with nothing many yes. times. Yes. So one thing that I think is very important, as it often overlooked, is that we make an assumption that if someone believes something that we also believe, they can't be a jerk. And that's dangerous. That's a very dangerous approach. Because remember, I'm saying it's not about what you believe. You can. There are jerks of every possible flavor. And the way I think of it is that there's a path to becoming a total jerk. No matter what path you're on, there is some detour by which you can play God if you're tempted. So I have a friend, for example, who was a member. She was religious, and she went, uh, she went to church, and she met her husband through the church. And he was a fellow churchgoer, and he, he said the same prayers and all of that. And she assumed, assumed that he could not possibly be a jerk. How could he be a jerk? He believes what I believe. You've got to overcome that. He turned out to be a very dangerous person for this, uh, for this woman I knew, and it took her a long time to uh, escape his, his clutches. That's one thing. Another thing is, I find it very useful. Another way to pose your question is, how do you signal that you're not a jerk? How do you show people that you're not a jerk? And here's one thing that I have found very useful. And it's consistent with what I just said about 
everything I say is a bet. When I am saying that it's raining out, I do not have to qualify it by saying, I think it's raining. If I'm saying something controversial, I have to qualify it. I cannot say, AJ, you're being defensive. I am not the authority. I'm not even the authority on what I feel. I cannot say to you, I'm not attacking you, as if I know everything that goes on with me. I don't know everything that goes on with me. I have to qualify it. So if I want to say, uh, I, I don't, if, if I want to say, I'm not attacking you, I have to say, my guess is that I'm not attacking you, or, or I don't, um, uh, I don't, I could be wrong, but I don't believe I'm attacking you. Or if I, if I want to say, you're being defensive, I'd have to say, I think that you're being defensive. You know that it's just my opinion, but you need signs from me that I know it's just my opinion. And if I can convey those, that subjective quality to it, if I can say this is just my guess, um, that helps. And that also helps in detecting. If, you hang, if you're spending time with someone who talks as though they are the authority, you are having a conversation as equals, but they keep on pretending that they're the judge deciding what's true and what's not. Chances are you're getting very close to someone who is going to be dangerous company. Maybe not an absolute jerk. An absolute jerk does that all the time. But uh, at least a dangerous person. You want to be with someone. If you're dating, don't be with someone who pulls rank on you and talks like they're the authority, as though they see clearly and what you believe is just your opinion. That's very dangerous. We are all subjective. And the, the better we get at admitting it, the, better, the safer we all are. Right. Right, Jeremy. So... In today's time, especially in online, you see, even I get a lot of, you know, requests from, I would not obviously name them, but experts who are experts in several things and many things. I We, we got seasonal experts, yes. uh, especially online. When it's about politics, they yes. become political experts. Yeah. So I never when call it's... myself an expert. I will never call <laughs> myself. No, I'm a specialist. I study these things. The idea of being an expert in psychology or uh, pol politics is ridiculous. That is, it's way too complicated. It's not rocket science. It's much harder than rocket science. To understand what's going on with human minds or co groups of human minds, that is in politics, no, you can't be an expert. You can be a specialist. You can focus, but that's very different. Right. I'm not an so, expert on, on jerks. Right. So we get, we get experts when and and when there is uh, you know politics as i said yeah. we get experts they we say get they're experts, experts. the us politics we have got many experts on india politics oh no, no everybody, everybody then, would like when, to... when <laughs> the web telescope comes up discussion they become experts on telescopes no, no, also no. on science right. and when in, in india there is uh, cricket is very famous so they suddenly become cricket experts now yeah. and they are quite uh, you know, learned people, several of them, they know and they are earning good. They have certain degree of uh, specialization in whatever they are doing. But yes. why do they do that? Is it because of the 15 minutes of fame on anywhere that they can get? How does it work? Are they jerks or are they specialists? How do you, uh, what would you tell about that? I, w I would what only their, call it. What is their origin? Well, th their origin is our appetite. We do not want to think of ourselves as trying. We would like to have the formula. So the demand for experts far exceeds the existence of experts. You can be an expert on certain things. Uh, I, you, know, you could become an expert at, uh, at uh, geophysics because physics is quite predictable, even though not quantum physics. Um, that is, you can become, I would still call myself an expert if I was that. But what I'm saying is you get very popular if you tell people, I have the recipe that is guaranteed to solve your problems. The hunger for that is huge. Can you imagine if you had cancer and you wanted to, and you were, you didn't know what to do about it because your cancer was complicated. Or if I, if I had cancer, I'll talk about me because it's tricky. Um, if I had cancer, I would want the formula. I would want someone who was an expert, even if they weren't, if they claimed that they were, I might be tempted to think they were. So because the demand is so high, um, that's, what we're, that's, that's why people move that way. 
the demand for anything can drive supply. People will be, if, if, if people say they want something, you just act like you can offer it, even if you can't. So I would say that's the main reason why they claim it. It's also playing God. That is, to be an expert literally means that you know everything there is to know, and anything you don't know is doesn't matter, um, and you have the formula. And I'm just saying nobody does. Nobody has throughout the history of life. Life has only tried. It has only struggled for its existence. Life has always been guesswork. You can do the right thing and it comes out wrong. You can do the wrong thing and it comes out right. Um, there are That's just built in. We are guessing what to do. Right, right. So still, you can you can still avoid online experts. You can just choose not to. You can switch off the TV. You can switch. Uh, you can log off your internet connection, or you can log off from the places where these jerks are giving their that's right on ex on their expertise, which they acquire every uh, every few few days. But it is very hard to do because we are so tempted by the idea that someone has a formula. So here's what I do about that. I watch movies. Uh -huh. I, if you're watching James Bond, you're watching an expert. Why are you watching an expert? He's not an expert. He's an actor. And, but he's an expert because they were able to make the movie backwards. That is, when you're making a story up, you can have it come to a happy ending and then fill in the details before it. For us, time moves forward. In the movies, you can make it so time moves forward, but the people who made the movie or the fiction of any kind we're able to write it backwards. So I, I to, 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 feel, to feel like God, I watch James Bond movies. And then when the movie's over, I get back to reality where there are no James Bonds. Right. There is none. That's not possible. Uh, things don't work that well in real life. Um, one false move and he's dead. So I like fiction as a place to, um, you could say, exercise our appetite for the perfect formula. But I then want to get back to reality. I don't want to get the two confused. And one of the problems we have right now, for example, in the United States, we've got people who are claiming to be like God, Donald Trump, for example, is that people get confused. That is, they, they go for the fiction where someone always has the right answer, and then they forget that it's fiction. Right, well, right, right Jesse. <laughs> but what, what to do when you are at home, or you are at office, uh, your, uh, your, your colleague is a jerk, your boss is a jerk, what do you do? You can't start watching a James Bond movie there. How do you deal in that situation? Do that, you change your job or you just, what do oh, you do? Oh, that's, that's a very hard problem. So one of, the, one of the famous sayings about jerks is never fight with a pig. You'll just get dirty and the pig likes it. Well, okay. that's a nice thing to say, and it's good advice if you can escape a jerk, escape them. But many of us are stuck, often because of just the circumstances, the luck of where we grew up, or because we made big decisions when we were young. We married a jerk. We took a job. The only job available was with a jerk. The, the jerk knows that it's the only job available, and so they'll exploit you. Um, what do you do in that situation? To fight them, you will get dirty. It is important to fight jerks, but a lot of people can't afford to. Um, but at least not immediately to fight them. They might be able to fight them once they have an escape planned. But if they haven't got an escape planned, they can't fight them, them so well. Um, this is a very hard situation. I wish I could offer a formula, but I am not an expert. I just try to figure out how to deal with those and here's a, here's a concept that I think is important to understand. We often use words as if, we often describe a behavior as if the behavior is always bad. Uh, I do not think that hating is always bad. I think sometimes you have to hate. I think that hating, the more you love something, the more you hate its opposite. If I love equality, I hate inequality. But I also think that lying is sometimes necessary. Here's a term we use in the United States. I don't know if you have it. Have you heard the term passive aggressive? Of course, of course. Okay, Recently, okay. There Good. was a great article on the on the BBC. I read it about it. How co-workers and workers are indulging in passive aggressive behavior, and that's yes. lead to leading to so much of toxicity at workplaces. That's right. At the same time, I think that 
passive aggressive isn't always bad. If I'm a slave working for a total jerk, okay. I cannot afford to fight them. So I have to be passive aggressive. It's the only way to give them a hard time. I do not begrudge a slave for doing that. Okay. What I think we mean by passive aggressive is when someone plays like they're the victim and they're not. They could be aggressive. There's room to talk. So for example, if you're married to someone and they and it's an equal marriage where they could talk, they could fight, they could argue, but they act like they can't, I think that's that's a kind of cheating. So I so what we mean is don't 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 play victim. But when you're stuck as you describe living with jerks, your boss is a jerk, your family is full of jerks. It's sometimes the only thing you've got is you can't be outwardly aggressive. You have to be passive aggressive. And I don't blame them for doing that when people are in that situation. I have a few ideas about how to do that as well, um, because I'm interested at once again, in how do you disappoint those people who are playing God? Because I'm, op I'm operating on the assumption that it's easier to play God than be human if you can get away with it. So I'm interested in how to keep people from getting away with it. So the, the other question is, how do you fight a jerk? And, and so I'll, I'll just say a couple of things about that. First of all, do not listen to their words. And do not argue with them about their words. They don't mean their words. It's braying. It's a sound they discovered that they can make with their mouths and get what they want. They never had to even think about what they were saying. They were stuck in a situation. They remembered something that someone had once said. They blurt it out. They just say it. It works. It becomes a habit. They never have to think about what they're saying. So don't think about it. Don't debate them. Um, instead, point out that they will say or do anything to avoid humility. And do it over and over. Say, see, you did it again. No matter what I say, you always have something to say that makes it sound like you're always right. And they'll say, no, you're wrong. And I then you say, see, you did it again. That's all you've got. You've got no ideas. You're not thinking. You're not feeling. You're just doing this automatic thing where you pretend that you've got the wild card trump card. That's one thing. The other thing I recommend is related to what we were just talking about. We have these words in our languages that sound like they make something always, they, they describe a behavior as if it's always bad. For example, suppose you decided that you want to leave the job. Suppose we were working together and you said, I'm leaving this job and I don't want you to leave the job. And I say, well, you're a quitter. Quitter sounds bad. Okay. But is leaving things always bad? No. Sometimes it's good to leave. If I said, uh, you're being stubborn, that sounds bad. Is it always bad to be stubborn? No. We have other words for stubborn that make it sound like it's always good. If I said, you're steadfast, that makes stubborn sound good. So you cannot be affected by those words. So when someone accuses me of being a hit, uh, of name calling, says, you're a name caller. I say, of course I'm a name caller. Like you, like everyone. If I said you were a nice guy, I would be name calling. I don't want to just name call. I want to name call in the right situations, not the wrong ones. Whereas you just pretend like you never name call, even though you just called me a name caller, which is name calling. Right. So you have to be able to, you have to be immune to this weird power we give words to that suggests that a behavior is always good or always bad. It depends on the situation. You cannot get defensive with these people. If they accuse, because they'll just accuse you of anything that sounds bad. And you have to not be, you have to be resistant to that. You have to be able to say, I'm interested in when it's bad. You just pretend that it's bad when it, when it helps you. So those are two things I do when I fight with jerks. Okay. Okay, Jeremy. So now let's look at the other side. Okay. If it's, if it's a jerk who is listening to you and maybe not now or later, then what would your advice be so that they can come out of that particular mindset of being a jerk? How can they help? How can you help them help themselves? I, I yes, I see. I so the so I have friends who are um, very busy 
thinking that the way to, to reach a jerk is to make friends with them. Um, okay. Some of them are even famous. Some of them would even be called experts. But no, I don't think that's the only thing. Sometimes you have to disappoint them. Sometimes you have to confront them. So this is where that what I was talking about a minute ago, I think the most helpful thing you can do is to disappoint them. To say, do you see what you're doing? You're just doing this automatic thing. And you're pretending that you are, uh, you are thinking or talking or are the expert. You're not the expert. You're just another human being like me. Um, and, uh, and you may even have power over me. You might be my boss. And I will do what you say, but that doesn't mean you're God. So to disappoint them, to confront them is important. And the moment that they start to show any kind of receptivity, you turn around instantly and you get very friendly with them and you get very vulnerable with them. And if they turn back, you go right back to your toughness with them. Say, I'm not, I'm not playing that game. I'm not going to be your disciple. You're not God and I'm not your disciple. But when they open up, you show them that there is reward to be had in admitting to their being to them being human like the rest of us welcome glad to have you back um what you did when you were being a jerk people do that all the time this no it, that that that's just human nature it's not like jerks are this other species and we get to condemn them forever no they're human beings i'm as likely to become a jerk as they are under certain circumstances so at that point you embrace them but before that, you but you don't you don't just go soft on them. Can you imagine? I mean, if you take some of the worst dictators in the world and imagine trying to be friends with them and soften them up, will not work. It will not work. Okay, okay. So uh, tell me now about your latest book. What's up with a holes? A holes. Ah, uh, yeah. Advanced psychoproctology for beginners. Tell yes. us about that. What is it? Is it for you know, is it for jerks or how to save yourself from the what is all about? How, it's all it's 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 for how to save yourself from jerks. Um, it's a very practical book. I was very I have had it read by academics, but I've also had it read by uh, laborers. And I am so proud that the laborers understood it. I wrote I worked very hard to make it a book that's very practical, very down to earth. It's got complicated ideas in it, but I make them simple enough that I was able to succeed with the people who read it. And I'm very proud that they were able, I'm very glad that I was able to achieve that because I was not trying to talk um, to scholars, not with this book. Um, it's a book that starts by asking the question, what distinguishes a jerk? And it goes through a bunch of popular ideas about what distinguishes a jerk that don't work. For example, are jerks always loud and angry and male and shouting and uh, and bullies, physical bullies? No, not at all. You can have very gentle jerks, jerks who you, who whisper. Um, it, it's not about how you strut it. Again, it's not about what you believe uh, because you can be a jerk for anything. Uh, you can play God hiding behind any brand, whether it be Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, atheist, whatever, none of that matters. I then go into some uh, an understanding that I described at the beginning of this about how with language we can idealize and we can self-idealize, we can deify and self-deify. And, um, and I explain how it works, I give some examples, and then by the end of the book, I have made some concrete suggestions for how to deal with jerks. But I also wrote this book, I dedicated this book to future psychoproctologists, people who study jerks, because I think they'll do a better job than I have. Because it's a new topic. We have not talked about it nearly enough. We talk about this jerk or that jerk, but we do not stop enough to ask the question, what is a butthead? Since it can't just be whoever I happen to butt heads with. So it's, a, it's, it's designed to be a very accessible book. Um, I even have it available for free on YouTube, me reading the whole thing alive. Uh, live, um, a good, careful reading for anybody who can't afford it. <laughs> right, right. And how, where, where do they 
find this book? How they can buy uh, it? If you, if you go to YouTube, oh, you you can find it on Amazon. And if you uh, and it, but if you go to YouTube, if you just look up what's up with a holes, Jeremy Sherman, you'll see the fourteen chapters of the book all lined up, and you can just listen to it. Right, right. Now let's move from yes. uh, that uh, that particular from jerks. Uh, okay, because I'm only yeah. worried about one thing if you are talking about work, uh, jobs. That, and we'll be coming to another topic that is so close to you is about the origin of life. But about the end of humanity, will it be a jerk who will lead to the end of our species or will it be a proper human being with a proper thinking process? What it, it will it be? If I were to make my prediction, it's that we have not answered the question, how do you humbly humble people who will say or do anything to avoid humility? That is, I think that jerks are the biggest problem in the world. I worked for 25 years on climate change. Um, I saw that as a very big problem. Climate change and nuclear war, I thought they were huge problems. And then I realized, no, the problem is not the technology. The problem is the human tendency to become like jerks. And right. so I'm, I do think that that's more likely, but I can also tell because nobody's an expert and because you can do the right thing and have it come out wrong. And because we have technology that is so powerful these days, it could also be an accident. But I think what we need to prevent is some jerks taking over and blowing us up. Because you were talking earlier about how do you help someone who's a jerk stop being a jerk? They don't want to stop. Think about it this way. When you're a jerk, you do horrible things that you can only justify by remaining a jerk. Right. So, uh, so it is very hard. They, they are addicted to playing God, and it is very difficult to get them to stop. That's why it's very important that we stop them before they get in positions of power. Because once they're in power, it's very hard to access them. So that's a very big challenge. But if I, if I were to make a prediction, it's our inability. I'll go further than this. Anywhere in the universe where there is a species, an extraterrestrial life, that has acquired language, they have probably dealt with the jerk problem. And any of those pla planets that are extinct, that where the, the life did not last, it would be because the jerks took over. Again, it's a thing about language. With language... I face way more anxieties than any other creature. Compare what I could worry about to what a dog could worry about. Because I have language, I can worry about so many things, including my own death. And I can make up fictional stories that make it so I don't have to face what scares me. So uh, what one psychologist says is the instinct to survive is strong. The instinct to alleviate fear is stronger. And I think this would be true for any creature with language. They could make up excuses why they don't have to face anything. So I would say that throughout the universe's history, I would bet that climate change and nuclear war have been real problems many, many times. And I also think that climate change denial, pretending it's not a problem, and nuclear war denial would have also been there because people would have had language. Right. Right. <laughs> right, Jeremy. See, you just talked about extraterrestrial and, uh, you know, other other species who gather language. So recently it was Fermi's birthday. And, you know, there is this Fermi, Fermi paradox. And yes, the exactly. Fermi. That's what I'm talking yes, about. Yes. I'm talking about so, the Fermi paradox. Right, jerks, are right. the, jerks would be my guess about why the uh, uh, in answer to the Fermi paradox. Right. It would be. So I, because you are such a big, a great science researcher. I'm not a, right. I'm a specialist. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought, you know, my, my curiosity uh, makes me ask this question is that, and when we are talking about the end of the human species and what, it, uh, what could lead to that and maybe some accident, what is your thought on that? Are we, uh, be, uh, uh, where does the filter lie? Uh, have we crossed the filter or we are yet to, do that so that we become important enough because if we cross it then we are closest to disaster almost all species intelligent species lead to their own destruction and if we have not then we are still insignificant i don't know why 
why we find ourselves so significant in the universe. So, so from my research on the origins of life, which is just a guess, but it's a careful guess, um, I came to this comforting conclusion. I believe that there's a good chance that we will discover three things in the future, in the short term, uh, in the next 30 years, let's say. One is we will discover that there is life on other planets. Another is that we will discover what makes life different. Okay. Basically, we will answer the question, what are selves and trying, and how did they start? We will know how life happens anywhere in the universe. We will have finally had an explanation for what we are that doesn't depend on miracles or supernaturalness. We will actually be able to explain, as my research tries to do, how chemistry that's not trying to do anything can become chemistry that's trying to keep going. That's what life is. So we will have discovered extraterrestrial creatures. We will discover that life, how life happens. And we will discover that we have crossed over. This is a dark scenario, but it's we will cross over and that we are not likely to survive and thrive as we have in past centuries, more or less. We were safer before. Not everybody, but the world didn't look like it was about to be blown up by the intelligent life forms. By the way, when you say intelligent life, I'm thinking life that uses language. That's the difference. There's lots of kinds of intelligence, but when we talk about intelligent life in the universe, we're talking about creatures who can communicate with us, and that would be through language. Okay, so the bad news is that we didn't last that long. The good news is that life goes on in the universe and that there are probably other intelligent life forms elsewhere. And we used our time here to learn um, how that happens. And I should say, my greatest joy in the entire world is to sit on the front porch of the universe with a fellow like you, AJ, and speculate <laughs> about it all. Because nothing else in the universe can do this. Plants can't do this. Animals can't do this. Computers can't do this. It's only us with our powers of language that enables us to speculate about the whole ball of wax and us stuck in it. And so what better use of our lives than to do a little bit of that speculating, wondering what this all is. If we can afford the time, if we aren't working for a jerk or if we get some time off, um, that's a use. I, I love doing that. So I, I knew I was going to die sometime. I was very disappointed. I'd like to think that death is for losers and that I'm not one, <laughs> but that's not how it works. Um, I'm going to die. I knew that. Um, and maybe humanity is going to die. When I think about it, um, if you take the whole history of life on earth and you scrunch it down to one year, language life has been going on for about 15 minutes at the end of that year. It's tiny. It's a very difficult experiment to make work. Language, as a, the evolution of language makes us very different and very dangerous. It's a very precarious way exactly. to live. Animals don't have this problem. Um, they live within their means and their means are much more limited. So that's my sense of it. And in the meantime, I work, I'm what we call a romantic realist. Um, I try to face reality very straightforward not when I'm watching movies at night, but during the day, I try to really look at it as, as honestly as I can. Um, it's very disappointing. I did not expect there'd be this many jerks in the world or that they would get this far. When I was growing up in the 1960s in California, we thought everybody was done being jerks. We really did. We were completely naive. Um, so that's disappointing. Um, but I'm a romantic. I work all day on this stuff, I, and it doesn't disappoint me. Um, it doesn't make me try any less when I see, oh, we're in trouble. I have a good friend who's famous, at least in the United States, a, na a guy named Dan Ellsberg. He right. invented uh, behavioral economics, and he was famous for helping to stop the Vietnam War. Right. He's 91 right. years old now. And he, we get together, and we both share this agreement. That is, we don't think that the prospects are good, and it doesn't change our effort at all. At 91, he still works full-time to try and save the world. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, 
tell me one thing, uh, Jeremy, is that now can a machine, an artificial intelligent machine who knows about almost all languages of the world can turn into a jerk and destroy humanity? Ah, great question. So, um, so because, you see, because you see, you are the author of Columbia University Press book, Neither Ghost Nor Machine, The Emergence and Nature of Self. We have written hundreds, thousands of articles, and you have got 9 million readers for psychology today. So Ten. when you put all those things together, psychology and everything, and not knowing machines, so you see humans have transferred everything to the machines now. They are doing that. Artificial intelligence, machine learning. So machine learning, they are learning everything about us. I don't know what humans are learning or not learning or unlearning. But they have certainly not forgotten about empathy and certainly about humanity, a lot of them. So I wanted to ask you, that is this question, in the backdrop of all your learning, yes. of all the meeting of the great people, uh, with great people sitting with them, that can a robot, an artificial intelligence lead to, you know, to the destruction of humanity? Because that you said, humanity yeah. can be wiped out also by accident. Right, right. So... Um... So a couple of things about that. Um, first of all, machines are radically different from us. We are at risk in a way that a machine is not. I don't just mean that we, are, we feel at risk. We are in the business of regenerating ourselves. Because uh, if there's one universal rule, it's that things fall apart. That order becomes disordered. So... This is going on below the level of psychology, below the level of words. Today, I produced 440 billion new cells. I had to, to replace the cells that died in me today. Computers don't do any of that. They don't, the, the energy comes to them for free, and they're machines. Machines don't make themselves. I'm in the business of making myself. And so in our origins of life research, I have to explain how a chemical system would keep on remaking itself, how it would regenerate itself faster than it otherwise degenerates. If you want to see how fast we degenerate, uh, uh, go to Varanasi. Um, I mean, you, you watch how fast a dead body decays and you recognize how much work any living being has to do to keep regenerating itself. Machines do none of that. Now, um, are we at risk because of our machines? Sure, and it doesn't take AI to put us at risk. That is, nuclear weapons are already on some kind of automatic system that's not AI, and it could destroy us. AI does complicate the issue, but we must remember a machine knows nothing. A machine is an artifact. It know, it, we put information into it, and we interpret information out of it. The machine knows nothing. What do you get if you put a jillion AI computers on, a, on, a, on an, a sterile planet and wire them all up? You get a sterile planet. They're not alive. They're just tools. In a way, it's like asking, are books getting smarter than they used to be? A book is just an artifact. But what's interesting to me is what I call robo-envy. Remember I was talking about how we desire experts and we want a formula? I think people want to be robots. I think we dread being robots, but there's a part of us that dreams that we could be simply reprogrammed um, by some great revelation. And suddenly, we're reprogrammed. That's not how we work at all. I, I mean, if you're married and you try to reprogram your wife, it's not like updating the software. It's not like that at all. You can say something, it goes in one ear or out the other. It might have a little influence for a couple of weeks. We are not robots, but sometimes we kind of wish we were. It's one of the reasons why I like spending so much time working on my computer. It has no interests. It doesn't care at all. It's the perfect servant. In the caste system, it's ideal. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. And if it doesn't, you just load in other, com uh, other software and it does it. Um, it's completely attentive because it has no skin in the game. It doesn't care. When I turn it off at night, it's not disappointed. <laughs> when I stop listening to my wife, she's disappointed. <laughs> so. But social media is disappointed if you turn it off because they want your eyeballs. They want all the time that you've got. 
Got it, but there's a difference. The okay. computer doesn't. The programmers do. So it's garbage in, garbage out, jerk in, jerk out. I have been talking. I, I have a friend who works as a programmer at Twitter, and I asked him recently, how hard would it be to design a jerk bot, a robot <laughs> that talks just like a jerk? Because I said, it's got to be easy. It can't be hard. How hard would it be to make a, a, a computer program that talked just like Donald Trump? I think it would be very easy. It wouldn't be hard at all. Because they're not paying attention to what they say <laughs> at all. Um, I even made a, I made a video about this, about, um, yeah, about the design of a jerk bot and what, what it would do and what it would have to do. And it would simply find the positive word and use it about itself and the negative words and use it about the other person. And it would be super simple. So I'm especially interested in people who wish they were uh, robots. <laughs> right, right, right. There is so much to talk to, you know, and, and it's such a great learning just listening to you, Jeremy. I can tell you so surely for that. It's not about a podcast or a few minutes of this, uh, you know, just a few words here and there. But actually... Yeah. There is so much to learn from you, and there is a great degree of perspective in what you talk Thank on you. different aspects of life and several aspects. It delves deep into the human psychology and deep into not only the past, but also into the future. So a lot of people would like to connect with you, know more about you, to read more about your stuff. How do they do that? What are the right ways to connect with you? What are the right resources that they can reach about? So, um, uh, first of all, I'm coming to Kodania to, so we can spend time together. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm. Uh, um, it's easy to find me on on Google. You'll find way too much of me if you go to Google. Just put in my name. But I also have a website called Jer uh, JeremySherman.com. I also am very active on Facebook. Um, uh, and that means that anybody can friend me on Facebook and you'll find that every day I put out lots of memes, many of them funny, all of them observations. When I get an idea, I put it out as a meme. I just share it there. So you can find too much of me there too. I have three podcasts. I have uh, the two books. I have two YouTube channels, one on Origins of Life, the other on Jerks. Um, and, uh, and, and you can email me. I'm js at jeremysherman.com. And chances are good I will write back to you because I, I have a full inbox and a empty schedule, which is just wonderful. I get to work all day. I'm very lucky this way. Um, so I'm easy to find. You have no excuse for not finding me other than that you don't want to find me. <laughs> That's your only excuse. If you want to find me, I'm available. <laughs> It's, it's the same for God. If you find them, if you look for God, he is available. Well, but of course. And I, I know that about God because I am. <laughs> well, I mean, when you listed all the things I've written, I said, am I an expert yet? No. <laughs> on this note, it's a wrap on this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be with you. Namaste.